This video is all about the material properties of liquids. And we know from everyday experience that liquids have a variety of different properties and can vary in a number of different ways. So what really characterizes the liquid state is this ability to flow. But flow, for example, can happen at different rates and with different eases, we might say. For example, it's a lot harder for honey to flow than it is for water to flow. We can understand the reasons for this difference by thinking through intermolecular forces, which is why this video shows up here. So we're going to connect those material properties to intermolecular forces to some degree so that we can reason from molecular structure to predictions about expected properties of liquids. So before we get into the properties, I wanted to really just start with the submicroscopic level so that we're all on the same page about how to think about a liquid at the molecular level. So liquids are characterized by flow. The molecules are to some extent still bound to one another, but they're able to flow and move over and past one another. So here we have a submicroscopic simulation of liquid water. And you can see the molecules sort of tumbling around with the ability to move sort of over and, and through one another. This is characteristic of the liquid state. And this is the model that we should keep in mind for liquids. They have the ability to flow like this, but the ease of flow, the tightness with which the liquids are bound to one another, the solidness on some level of this state depends on the strengths of intermolecular forces. The first property we're going to look at is called viscosity. And this is a measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. The harder it is for a liquid to flow, the greater the viscosity. Another way to think about it is the rate of flow or the time required for a certain type of flow to take place. More viscous liquids, such as honey, take longer to flow, say, the same distance than liquids with a lower viscosity, like water. And viscosity depends on the conditions in which a liquid is in and its molecular structure. So, for example, viscosity depends on temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving and the easier flow becomes. So viscosity decreases due to that increased kinetic energy of the molecules. They're more easily able to move past one another, more easily able to surmount the potential energy barriers associated with intermolecular forces and things like this. Molecular size and shape also matters for bigger, larger, longer, more spaghetti-like molecules that can wrap around one another. Viscosity tends to go up because flow becomes harder as the molecules become intertwined and have more ways to interact with, engage with one another in intermolecular forces. And of course, the strengths of intermolecular forces also matter profoundly. Increasing strength of intermolecular forces is associated with greater viscosity. And we can see some of that going on in the table right here. So for example, octane, which has only London dispersion forces, has quite a low viscosity. Waters is somewhat higher due to the hydrogen bonding interactions that we find in water. And, and as we move to larger molecules with more ways to hydrogen bond and more ways to kind of interlock with one another, interact, we get even greater viscosities. Honey is a polysaccharide, a solution of a polysaccharide, essentially, and has a very large number of these OH groups that can hydrogen bond, which is part of the reason it has such a massive viscosity relative to the others. Forces occurring within a liquid are responsible for viscosity. Cohesive forces in particular, these are intermolecular forces between molecules within a liquid phase. We're going to contrast these with a different type of force here in a second. And cohesive forces are responsible for viscosities to some extent, as well as surface tension. Surface tension you can think of as an energy. It's the energy required to increase the surface area of a liquid by some Units. So the units are an energy per area, and this is equivalent to a force per length, the force required to lengthen the surface by some unit length. Surface tension is derived from cohesive forces. The stronger the cohesive forces, the greater the surface tension. And surface tension, when it's greater, tends to cause the surface to want to minimize its area, right? Because high surface tension means I got to put a lot of energy into the liquid in order to expand or enlarge the surface. With that high surface tension, the liquid will tend to want to minimize its energy by minimizing the surface area. And this encourages spherical droplet formation, right? So liquids with a high surface tension, water is a nice example, tend to form 
droplets. Mercury is another example of a substance with very high surface tension due to pretty strong co cohesive forces between the mercury atoms, and this tends to form droplets. If you've ever seen mercury spread out on a surface, it's a pretty dramatic effect. This table shows surface tensions for a number of different substances, and we can see the connection to intermolecular forces here to some degree. So octane, quite low surface tension with very weak intermolecular forces, only London dispersion forces happening in a typical sample of octane. And as we go up to stronger intermolecular forces, for example, hydrogen bonding, we start to see higher surface tensions, a greater tendency to form droplets, stronger cohesive forces due to the stronger IMFs, all that good stuff. And as we add more hydrogen bonding groups, make the molecules a little bit bigger, the surface tension tends to go up. Now, mercury is on a whole nother level in terms of surface tension, way, way higher than all of the others in terms of a force per length. And the reason is that the intermolecular forces, quote unquote, in mercury are really metallic bonds between the mercury atoms, right? They're really not intermolecular forces at all. They're bonds to some extent. Because of the relatively strong metallic bonding in liquid mercury, its surface tension is massive. It's on its way to becoming a solid metal, right? The fact that it's liquid is sort of an accident of nature. In contrast to cohesive forces, adhesive forces are IMFs between molecules of two different substances in contact. For example, when a liquid is in contact with a solid surface sitting in a container or tube or something like this, adhesive forces may exist between the walls of the tube and the liquid molecules. And this is responsible, for example, for the shape of a meniscus. So here's an interesting experiment. We've got two glass tubes with two different substances inside the tubes, mercury on the left and water on the right. And something you should notice is that the meniscus of the mercury is sort of bumped up like this. It's, it's sort of convex is one way to think about it from this perspective, it's bulging upward. But water's meniscus is actually bulging downward. It's facing sort of the opposite direction. The difference between these two meniscuses, menisci, can be traced to the difference in strengths between the adhesive and cohesive forces for the mercury and water inside a glass tube. So mercury is a metal and it tends to bond more strongly to itself than the non-metal glass substance. So there's stronger cohesion within the mercury. This tends to cause the mercury to want to form a droplet-like surface, a spherical bulging meniscus like you see right here that bulges upward. Water, on the other hand, being a non-metal, having the ability to hydrogen bond with OH groups in the glass has stronger adhesive forces with the glass than cohesive forces with itself. This causes the meniscus to sort of bulge inward because the water molecules are more strongly bonded to the glass tube walls than to other water molecules, causing the meniscus to bend in like this. Adhesive forces can promote the motion of a liquid through a small tube, and this is called capillary action, maybe a small tube or a porous material like a paper towel. This is due to a combination of adhesion, which pulls the molecules along the surface, and cohesion, which causes the molecules at the front of the moving liquid to pull molecules behind up onto the surface or up through the tube. So for example, if you place a paper towel in, for instance, a saucer of wine, the wine starts to move up the paper towel on its own, seemingly defying gravity. It's not really defying gravity though, right? The forces that move the liquid up are a combination of adhesive forces between the molecules in the wine, the sugars, the ethanol, etc., and the molecules in the paper towel, which include OH groups that can hydrogen bond with the sugar and ethanol molecules in the wine, as well as the water molecules in the wine. Those cause this front to move upward, and wine continues to travel up the paper towel behind the front due to cohesive forces between the molecules in the wine itself. So a combination of adhesion and cohesion promotes this capillary rise effect. And we take advantage of this in chemistry in a number of ways. Chromatography, for example, uses this principle. A solvent carrying solutes within it moves up the front. The solutes interact differently with the walls of whatever solid medium or solid support that the liquid is moving through. And this causes a separation of the solutes based typically on their relative polarities or sometimes on their relative sizes.